Okay, welcome Yang Yang Zhu, and thank you everyone for joining online and in person. I'm so excited to be introducing Yang Yang. Uh, she's an assistant professor of political science at the University of British Columbia, currently at Harvard. Uh, and she's here to present her book project, Rejecting Co-Ethnicity, The Politics of Migrant Exclusion by Minoritized Citizens. So this is part of Yang Yang's broader research agenda on the causes and consequences of migration and forced displacement with a focus on social cohesion outcomes um, and looking at how shared ethnicity can mediate some of the backlash effects that we find from uh, migration. Uh, she also has another strand of her work that looks specifically at developing statistical tools for asking sensitive questions in sensitive contests, uh, contexts and respecting respondent privacy. So I'm really excited to see some of the fruits of this labor on both strands of research potentially. And yeah, join me in welcoming Yang Yang. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm happy to take questions throughout the presentation. So, so please uh, drop me. Um, all right, thank you for that very kind introduction. So I'm gonna start off with this presentation with a little bit of audience participation. So I'm gonna need you to chime in. Um, so, you know, we all have many parts of our identities that are important to us. And some of those identities feel more important to us compared to others at any given moment. Um, here are some possible identity categories. They're not comprehensive. Maybe something like your political identity, your race or ethnicity, your nationality, your gender, your job, um, or maybe you just feel uniquely me at the moment, you know, not, not really feeling any of these categories. Um, if I ask you to imagine you have like 10 identity tokens that you can distribute across these six categories, just asking you, how would you do that um, currently as you identify? So just take a moment and think about it. You don't have to tell me, but just think about it. Where would you put more of your identity tokens into the different categories because you feel more strongly um, about that right now? Okay, I hope you had a moment to think about it a little. And now my question is, what contextual change would shift how you just made that distribution? Maybe you're in a different place geographically, maybe other people are here, you're, you're in a different setting or the, the setting changes around you. Um, any examples of how this whole distribution would shift for you if uh, you had a different change in your context? Yes, Salma. Well, race or ethnicities would be big for me. Maybe five out of my 10 tokens would go there. Okay. But if I was in the Middle East, it would be less. Mm. Whereas when I'm here, it's higher. Why is that? Relation. Because here I'm a minority, so it's more salient that yeah. I'm different. But when I'm back home, it's not salient because everyone's the same as me. So. Interesting. Yeah. So what makes you stand out in a context? Sometimes yeah. you feel um, more identified to that. Um, sure. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I put um, five of my tokens in nationality, and that was probably because I was recent. I'm um, traveling on, on spring break, and I just went through visa application processes, okay. and so that's in my mind. Yeah, of course. So you just went through a whole process that really heightened um, your national identity. Um, you know, thank you so much for sharing. Um, I'm Chinese American. And so, yeah, kind of the same. Like when I'm, I'm here in the US, I feel very Chinese. I think people, when they see me, they just assume that I'm Chinese and will, you know, try talking to me in Chinese. Um, but when I'm in China, I feel very American because all the Chinese people around me are like, why is your Chinese so bad? Um, why don't you understand any of our cultural references? Um, things like that. And so, but, you know, if my family were here, um, I don't know, I think I would feel more Chinese. Um, so lots of different ways that our context can change and it can be very quick. So, you know, just a, a small shift can really shift how strongly we're identifying. All right, thank you so much for um, doing that little exercise with me. So basically the, the big research question I'm trying to ask in this project is what happens when a new group of people arrive? How does that shift the identities of the existing group of people there? And specifically I'm talking about migration and migrants. 
So how do the existing people, host citizens, react when migrants come in? And in fact, they share similar cultural language and ethnic backgrounds. So those host citizens, I'm gonna call them co-ethnics because they share ethnic ties with the new migrants. And so if these host citizens are not welcoming, why not? And so a lot of the research that's already been done on immigration and immigrant reception has been done in the US and Europe. And in these contexts, we know that um, at least in the US, we're really looking at migration coming from Asian countries, from Latin America, or in Europe, it's migration coming from the Middle East or North Africa for the most part. And there, there are a lot of religious, racial, ethnic differences. Um, and so these scholars and many others have found that you know, when they're looking at white majoritized citizens, their um, antipathy towards immigrants, the new immigrants coming in, a lot of that is driven by fears over racial, ethnic, religious differences. And so from that literature, we might assume that absent those differences, if there's co-ethnicity, there's gonna be a lot more welcoming. Um, similarly, we know from a lot of sociological literature that ethnic enclaves in a place, so having host citizens that share co ethnic ties, is really important for migrant integration. If you're a new migrant, you go to a country, you try sometimes to find people who look like you, who share your cultural background. They tend to be the ones who will have networks for you. You can find a dentist, you can get your kids enrolled in school. So those are really important. Um, and we also know from a lot of research done in the US that you know, if those groups are minoritized in that country, um, discrimination might foster a sense of linked fate of solidarity. So all of this research points to your co-ethnics should accept you, they should welcome you. But of course, we do see cases of co-ethnic rejection, and a lot of that literature is based on economic competition. So maybe these new migrants come in, they look like you, importantly, they might share the same set of skills as you, and so you might feel economically competitive, and that's why we see co-ethnic rejection. Um, and, you know, policymakers largely have this assumption, too, that if there's co-ethnicity, there's going to be welcoming. And so this is a rather long quote from a, a senior UNHCR official. The UNHCR is the UN Agency on Refugees. And uh, when I talked to this person, he said, you know, refugees, for the most part, cross the border not too far from where they come from. These borders, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, are artificial. I'll talk about what that means in a little bit. But basically, you have on both sides of the border populations that know each other and from the same clan. And the example he gives is Dadaab camp in Kenya with Somalis on either side, which is a case I'm going to talk about. He says these communities know each other, they're homogenous. Um, you know, in this kind of context, migrants don't go where they're not welcomed or wanted. And so you move to parts of the region where you know people will not reject you. And this is important because the context he's talking about is, you know, people who are migrating because they're experiencing some form of displacement, either through conflict or natural disaster. And we know that these people, you know, the, the number of these people are growing every year around the world, but they are mostly staying in global South context. So they're not really going to US or Europe. They're mostly, um, as that UNHCR official said, they're just crossing the border. Here's another way to look at this data. Uh, my co-author Andrew Shaver and I collected um, geo-located data on where these displacement populations are, like refugee camps, um, asylum seeker communities, IDP camps. And again, you can see most of them are, a lot of them are in Sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of the global South. And so taking in that context, my theory is that when the host state and politicians stigmatize migrants in a place, those host citizens, the co-ethnics who share ties with those migrants, they're gonna feel this fear of being mistaken for the stigmatized group. They're going to fear being migrantized and discriminated against 
by the state and by other majoritized host citizens. So they're co-nationals who belong to majority ethnic groups. They're gonna heighten their national identity in order to distance themselves because that's something that they don't share with the new migrant groups. And they may espouse anti-migrant sentiments and support anti-migrant policies, which is you know, particularly troubling because again, you know, when the migrants come in, they're looking towards these communities to welcome them. And so very quickly, this is sort of like how I lay out my cases. Um, uh, here we can see these are, you know, two states of the world, either the host government is stigmatizing migrants or they're not. When they do, and you have co-ethnic groups who are located um, kind of proximate to them, in this case geographically, that's going to follow the case where they're going to reject those migrants because they're going to fear being mistaken for migrants themselves. Um, when they're farther away, maybe they feel less of that pressure, and so they might react more neutrally. And then for your non-coethnic, your majoritized groups, um, they usually just take in or help, you know, perpetuate some of these negative stereotypes, so they're going to act exclusionary. Whereas, you know, in the case where the state does not stigmatize migrants, even if you are mistaken for being a migrant, you're not going to um, really feel like you're suffering any negative consequences for the most part. And so you here is where we will see solidarity. These are the cases where, um, yeah, co-ethnics are welcoming. Okay, so I'm going to test this theory mostly in the East African context, but at the end, I'll talk about some other contexts where I think this phenomenon happens, which is a lot of places in the world. Um, and the three countries I'm gonna focus on are Tanzania, Kenya, and Uganda. Um, here's a map of all of East Africa. You can see that these three countries, um, they host a lot of refugees and from neighboring countries. So a lot of groups are, are shared. So um, they all host like South Sudanese, for example. And they've been hosting refugees for a very long time. Um, in fact, when the UNHCR starts recording, you know, how many numbers of refugees are in these countries, they basically start at the year of independence. So even at the year of independence, there are refugees there, meaning that there have been refugees there before independence and they only start recording it then. Um, and yeah, you know, uh, the refugees that they are hosting across the border, they all tend to be crossing colonial borders. And that means, you know, a lot of these borders, when you hear artificial colonial borders, it's because colonial authorities in the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, you know, in Western Europe drew these lines. So they're not drawn by indigenous groups living there. And so what that mostly means today is you can cross some of these borders and you won't see anything. You won't see the line. Um, and communities across these borders kind of just live as one, especially if they're co-ethnic. And so this is how um, the cases in East Africa sort of fit my theory. Um, I'm gonna go through them line by line, but let's start with the Ha Tanzanians in Kigoma. Um, and so this is a case where the Tanzanians in the host country of Tanzania, they are co-ethnic with the Burundian refugees coming in from the other side of the border, but they're living in a context where the host government stigmatizes refugees. Um, and so, you know, Tanzania has been hosting, again, refugees since its independence, but for, you know, throughout the, the 2000s, I think they were hosting about like, not too many, maybe around 50,000 Congolese refugees who've been there since the 90s, and that was pretty stable. And around that time, up until 2014, there was only one refugee camp in Tanzania, it's called Nirgusu. And here's what it looked like in 2014. When you're there on the ground, they look like semi-permanent structures. Um, they have their own blocks, their schools. And yeah, it's mostly Congolese refugees. Um, in early 2015, there was a political crisis in the neighboring country of Burundi. The president there you know, wanted to change the constitution and run for a third term. That kicked off a lot of protests. And so a lot of people, um, especially, you know, thinking about the, the genocide there that just happened like a few years earlier, they went to Tanzania. And here you can see that the refugee camp, basically in a few months time, more than doubled in size. And I think it was about like 230,000 
um, refugees from Burundi came. And so, you know, this area is hosting like 50,000 here, it's like 230. Um, and so what that looks like here is not so many permanent structure, it's just rows and rows of UNHCR tents. Um, and this is a context where the, the host government of Tanzania represses the Burundian refugees. So they force them to be in camps. They are not allowed to leave the camps. Um, recently, they have been pressuring them to return to Burundi. They've been forcibly disappearing and torturing them. And then the rhetoric around Burundian refugees is one of criminality, security concerns, disease concerns, overcrowding. Um, and so to give you a sense, here is the country of Tanzania. These are where you know, the sort of economic and political capitals are in the country. And the region that we're interested in is Kigoma. It's all the way over here. It's a border region, bordering Burundi right there. Um, as a border region, it is you know, poorer compared to many of the other regions of Tanzania. Um, Kigoma often ranks worst in terms of like school outcomes, health outcomes. So it is a marginalized area. In Kigoma, um, the majority group in that region is called the Ha, but they are a minority group nationally. Um, and yeah, they are considered co-ethnic with the Burundi Hutus on the other side, meaning they do speak the same language, they have similar cultural backgrounds, they often intermarry, and that sort of border in between the two are, is kind of non-existent. Um, so even when I was there, it was really easy just to walk across the border. Um, and communities on either side use the same water sources, um, you know, go to the same markets. And so this is zooming in on that area of Kigoma. Here is the sort of regional capital, Kigoma town. And these are the three refugee camps that are there now. So Niragusu was the one that I showed you photos before um, that was there sort of, uh, yeah, to receive all the new refugees in 2015. At the end of 2016, there were so many new refugees coming in that they opened up these two other camps, Ndutan to Delhi. Um, and so in 2015, just a few months after the refugees started coming in, um, I was there and I got to do some community focus groups. And so here it shows you sort of the 10 community focus groups I did. Um, that sort of blue dot is where near Gusu is. And then these are like the 10 different communities that I kind of randomly selected um, to do community focus groups. Each focus group, um, I think had around like 10 to 15 people. And again, these are all Tanzanians. They're, they're hot Tanzanians. And then the following summer, I came back and I ran a survey. So this shows you basically where my survey respondents are. To give you a sense, there's like a lot of geographic variation, right? Some of the survey respondents are quite close to the camp and some are far. And again, um, in the survey, this is how I sort of measure identity. It's that same distributional measure that I showed you before, except the categories are Kigoma, that's like their subnational regional identity, your ethnic group, your um, national identification, uh, your region of East Africa, maybe you feel Pan-African or you have this like sort of um, catch-all kind of last category of I'm just me, I don't really fit any of these things. And so in my survey, I basically gave them 10 tokens to distribute across these six categories. Yeah. Just two quick clarifying questions. So I'm wondering what your use of the word ethnicity and co-ethnic. So the example yeah. you gave like Ha Tanzanians with Tutsi Burundians. So they're mm -hmm. not the same ethnicity, but they're considered co-ethnic. So yeah, how, with the Hutu, yeah. The Hutu, sorry. Yeah. Um, I should have defined co-ethnicity. That's a great question. So co-ethnicity in my case is sort of, it's both that you yourself have some sort of recognition of co-ethnicity. So based on like descent-based ties or, you know, a, a myth of a common origin, all of those things. So you have some agency over that. And so those communities in Burundi, I think they're called Hutu, but in Tanzania, they're called Ha, but they do, they speak the same language, they intermarry. Um, and so there, there's like your, the self-recognition part, but I think the other really interesting part of the de defining co-ethnicity is like your recognition that other people will group you into the same group. Mm -hmm. And so there's a part of that where you don't have much control over, but as like a 
second order concern, you recognize that other people are going to say that we're co-ethnic, even if I might not consider myself co-ethnic. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, like with, you know, other East Asians, like, you know, people coming from Japan or Korea, like I might not say that we're co-ethnic, um, but I recognize that other Americans would look at us and say, oh yeah, you are a part of the same ethnic group. So is it based on like physical descriptors? It could be language, yeah, yeah um, okay. cultural markings, dress, all the sort of things that we might, you know, try and define ethnicity with. But I think it's just the, the, the important part is like part of it is my own self-recognition and part of it is my recognition of how others, outsiders mm -hmm. might group me. And why is religion not one of the circles? Oh, that's a great question. Okay, if I put religion in here, um, the whole region is very Christian um, and it's, it's the same across the border. So if I had put in your religion, I think everyone would really just put that. And so um, the categories I'm really interested in are obviously ethnic group and your national identity. So comparing ethnic and national. So I wanted to make sure that the other categories were kind of just, not many people would use those categories. So I could see this variation, but yeah, if I put in religion, I think everyone would just put all their tokens into religion, but it is a very important identity. Okay, so the other part of the survey, so that's how I measure identity in the survey. The other part was um, half of the respondents, and I should say there was about like 2000 respondents here, half of them um, just started the survey without knowing it's a survey about refugees. They got those questions about identity. They saw that measure. So they're going in with the survey, not knowing it's about refugees. The other half start off with questions about refugees. So a little bit of information like, you know, there's this many that just came in, in the last few months. They live in Nirigusu. We show them a map of where Nirigusu is. Um, and then ask them some questions like, do you know which countries they're from? And some other factual questions. So for them, they're really primed to be thinking about refugees because they just answered a whole bunch of questions about them. So that group I'm gonna call the treatment group because they're primed to be thinking about refugees. So in the control group, again, these people don't know it's a survey about refugees. This is what those identities, their ethnic identification and their national identification look like. Um, the difference between co-ethnics, the ha, versus non-co-ethnics. Now, I will note that in this area, there's very few non-co-ethnics. I think my co-ethnics are like 90% of the sample. So there's just not that much variation for non-co-ethnics. But even still, you can see that for co-ethnic, compared to non-co-ethnics, they feel more ethnic. And that probably makes sense because they are the ethnic majority in the region. But if we turn to the treatment effect, so what is the the, what is it for people who actually answer all those questions about refugees first? We see there's no difference now on ethnic identity, but for your co-ethnics, they feel more national. And so, so far it looks, it's suggested that it's fitting my theory that when people, when co-ethnics are feeling like, um, in this case, sort of psychologically proximate to refugees because they're being reminded of them. They're being reminded that, hey, here's this group that kind of shares our ethnic identity. They end up feeling more national because that's the thing that differentiates them. We can look at this another way. So here um, on the x-axis, we're looking at distance from the camp. Because again, you know, when we surveyed people, I, I chose some people to be quite far from the camp, some people to be quite close. And so here, this means you're really close to the camp. Here, you're much farther away. And we can see, this is just at baseline. Again, this is the control group who don't even know that this is a question about refugees, this is a survey about refugees. For the people who are super close, they also feel more national. And so this is just like an observational component. Just by being close to the camp, they're gonna feel more national. Yeah. Um, just a clarifying question on um, on the baseline. Do you also see that um, for your about your treatment group, those who are closer to the camp, do they answer those questions about refugees more accurately um, in terms of like, knowing that their their ethnicity and like knowing where? Yeah, they're that's a great question. So. 
for the control group, they get those same questions. They just get it at the end of the survey. So I, I do get measures for both and there's no difference. Um, I think maybe, no, wait, there is a little bit of a difference. The people who are closer know that there's definitely Burundian refugees there. Um, I think everyone knows that there's Burundian refugees. Maybe the people who are farthest away um, I think there was some percentile I looked at. They would also say there's Rwandese refugees there and there aren't. So I think maybe, you know, they do have less information, but everyone knows that there's Burundian refugees there. That's a great question. Um, and here I'm going to show you that marginal, that additional effect of getting the survey treatment by distance. And you can see that um, for people who are closest to the to the camp, when you get that reminder that the survey is about refugees, they also feel more national. And that effect sort of dissipates as you get farther and farther away. In terms of the social networks, like are there social networks that connect the two sides together? Like I'm thinking about Syrian refugees that come to the US, mm -hmm. like they very quickly tap into like the Arab yes. and Muslim communities here and they help yeah. them with resources and whatever. So is there like, any network happening or are yes. they just like, oh, we're not them, they're a whole different That network. is a great question. So um, the next part of this, I'm gonna talk about focus groups, um, but before I get into the focus groups results, the focus groups themselves, I think shed a lot of light into this. Um, one focus group I went to was at the border and sort of start off my, my book introduction with the story. Um, when I went, you know, I sort of went to ask these questions like, what, what do you think about the people on the other side of the border? Um, what do you think about refugees? Tell me what it means to be Tanzanian. Those were the kinds of questions I asked. And there was a like a village elder there and he, the whole sort of focus group, the other community members started turning on him and they were saying, oh, that's our village elder and he hides refugees in his house. Like they're there right now if you go, like they're supposed to be in the camp, but he's hiding them. And they said that like there were sex workers and he was involved in like criminal activity. Um, and we basically had to kind of change the topic a little because it was getting really heated. Um, and at the end, you know, I approached him and I was like, um, I'm very, you know, sorry, like, do, do you want to tell me anything or, um, and he said that he was hosting his niece, who is Burundian on the other side of the border. And he's like, yeah, they're my family. Yeah, they, they're staying with me. But, um, you know, it, it actually ended up causing a lot of like, mistrust throughout the community. And a lot of the community members are trying to like, yeah, go to immigration officials to tell on him so that a bus can come and take those Burundians, his family members, to the camp because they're supposed to be in the camp. Um, yeah, so, and, you know, there was a lot of rumors about people hiding refugees in their houses because they are relative in, in, you know, um, in a lot of cases, they're not just like co-ethnics, but they're kin, they're literal relatives. Yeah. And um, what is the composition of both uh, the control and the treatment group? I mean, do you have like a good mixture of, I don't know, gender and age and yeah. other socioeconomic yeah, environments? For the, uh, so for the treatment groups, it's randomized. So it is, you know, because I have like 2000 respondents, it is very balanced on all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, and just in my sample as a whole, I have practically half men and women. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing that I, you know, that is imbalanced, though, is, of course, like distance to the camp. So people who are closer have different characteristics than people who are farther away. And, and the results that you get, that you have shown so far, are they, do they still hold uh, depending on these other characteristics? That's uh, a, yeah, that's a great question. So one way we can do that is just covariate adjustment and yeah. try and control for, for all the other demographic characteristics that we measure for. But another way I try to get at that is, if you recall in the map that I showed you a few slides earlier, there's actually two other camps that at this point of the survey, they don't exist yet. But a, a few, like almost a year later, there's going to be two future camps. And, um, and so I basically use them as like a placebo like test. Yeah. 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 And so I can look at this exact thing, but it's distance to Nijuta or distance to Mtendeli camp. And there's no results there. Um, and so we can think those future camps kind of have share the same characteristics of like what makes it that refugees, the, that there's a camp there. Great question. 
Okay, so that was just um, giving you an overview of how, in this context, co-ethnics, um, especially when they're reminded that refugees are there or that they're physically close to refugees, they feel more national. But what does the sort of national identity mean? We know national identity encompasses a lot of different attitudes, feelings. Um, and so we can turn to sort of the focus group evidence to look at this a bit more qualitatively. The, I only did 10 focus groups, so just keep that in mind. It's a pretty small N. Um, but I sort of had the same approach where I wanted to do something experimental. So on half of the groups, um, randomly, we would kind of do the same thing. We'd start off the discussion with refugees, and then we end the discussion with what is it, what is na your national identity mean to you? What does it mean to be Tanzanian? And so those are five groups. And again, each group has a mixture of men and women. Um, and then in the no prime condition, the sort of control condition, we just flip it. So we talk about, you know, national identity, living in the border, sort of, you know, the issues with your community, what does it mean to be Tanzanian first, and then we talk about refugees, All right? And so, you know, here's a quote from the no prime condition, um, when, you know, sort of living in the border comes up. Um, this person says, you know, we have villages on either side of the border that use the same river. Of course, we know each other. You will find a Burundian with uncles in Tanzania. So this is very much a story of co-ethnicity and kinship. Sorry, you yeah. have five focus groups in the prime condition and five in the yeah. non-prime? Mm -hmm. okay. And then in the primed condition, when we talk about refugees first, these are kind of the quotes that I see. So here, look, it's like, we know each other. Here, it's refugees will try to hide in our villages, but we Tanzanians know each other. It's clear we're not refugees. So here the conversation was probably like, how can you, how, how do you tell? This is like a question that I try to ask everyone, you know, like, is it easy to tell who's Burundian or not? Because, you know, like appearance, language, all of these things are, are very similar. Um, this other person says the new refugees are not good people because of their nature. So they're already sort of dehumanizing them um, to kill a person. They see it as normal. So a lot of quotes that are, are distancing. And so we can gather all of these um, focus group um, like sentiments. I think there's comments around like 300 comments. Um, and I had an RA basically code them based on um, you know, it, when they're talking about national identity, are they using in-group terms or out-group terms? Are they talking about their national identity as something that's inherited or is it inclusive? Um, do they want citizenship to be restricted or open? And in all of these, you can see the treatment group when we talk about refugees first, um, there's a lot more exclusionary nationalism and restrictions on citizenship. Okay, so that gives, I just picked out sort of some bits of evidence from the Tanzania case. Moving on to Kenya very quickly, I'm just gonna show you one result from Kenya. And uh, the Kenya example is kind of similar. They are in a context where the Kenyan state does stigmatize migrants, refugees, but really they mostly target one group, which are the Somali refugees. Um, and so there are Somali Kenyans that live near the main Somali refugee camp, Dada. Um, and in this case, you know, in the, in the previous case in Tanzania, I don't have that many non-coethnics, but in here I could do a survey in another part of the country where there are other um, refugees, the Sudanese, South Sudanese. And in that case, the people, the host community living there, they're not considered coethnic. So they have different traditions. They tell me that they look differently. Um, they dress differently. They actually say like, oh, um, you know, like the refugees are much taller than us. So when we see someone from far away, we just know that like just by looking, we can tell that they're a refugee. And in Kenya, similarly, you know, every few years, um, the Kenyan state sort of threatens to shut down all the camps and force people back to their countries. Um, and here there's, there's different reports. There's a couple done by Human Rights Watch that say um, the, the Kenyan police they will go after refugees who fall under curfews. And especially in times where there's like terrorist attacks that have, have happened in the past years, there's a lot of restrictions around refugees, Somali refugees, whether they can leave the camps. And when they encounter Somali Kenyans, so these are Kenyan citizens of Somali ethnic 
dissent, they will, they will, you know, paint them with the same brush. They will also arrest them, put them under curfew. And here's a police quoting saying, you're all terrorists. Like you're all the same to me, basically. Um, and so this past fall, I did a very similar kind of survey experiment in these two parts of Kenya. Dadaab, um, this is bordering Somalia. And so Dadaab um, hosts uh, Somali refugees. Kakuma camp um, hosts <laughs> South Sudanese refugees for the most part. They're also in sort of border, border regions. Um, so when we go, this is Kakuma camp. It's like technically two camps. And these are my survey respondents there. They're mostly of Turkana ethnicity. Um, so I'm gonna call them Turkana Kenyans. And again, they're not really considered co-ethnic with the refugees near them. Um, this, is, this shows the three camps under Dadaab. And in the purple are my Somali Kenyan respondents and they are co-ethnic. And so just one quick result. Again, when I use that sort of distributional identity measure, we can compare, um, this is just at baseline, ethnic identification and national identification. Here we can see for both groups, the, the, the Garissa is Somali, Kenyans, co-ethnic. These are non-co-ethnic. And both are pretty similar. You know, they feel pretty ethnic, um, somewhat national, but less so. But under the survey, I had two treatment conditions. One I'm gonna call camp closure. And this is sort of, um, I presented it as a radio news story where they heard a little radio snippet about, you know, the Kenyan government is announcing that they, that, you know, in the past wanted to close all the camps for different reasons. One is like security concerns, environmental concerns. And so again, it sort of is a, um, hopefully like a nuanced and not super heavy handed, but it is a reminder that refugees are stigmatized in the country. The other treatment is called refugee rights. So Kenya is sort of like a transitional stage right now because last year they passed new legislation that would actually treat refugees more inclusively. It's not being implemented yet, but it is possible. So some things like allowing refugees to leave the camps, allowing them the formal right to work. So this treatment, they, they heard a news story that was, yeah, basically saying, hey, refugees might be treated better in this country. They might be given new rights. And then the baseline was like a placebo story um, about motorcycle taxis. And what we can see is that under the sort of stigmatizing news story camp closure for co-ethnics, again, they feel less ethnic and they feel more national. Under the treatment where they're hearing that refugees might be given more rights, they actually, uh, these effects are not statistically significant, but for the top one, you can see they actually feel a little bit more ethnic. Um, and again, that's the identity that they share with the refugees. For your non-co-ethnics, just null results, basically. And that's what we would expect. You know, their identification does not hinge on how refugees near them are being treated for the most part, because they know they're never going to be mistaken as a refugee. And so in the same survey, I wanted to ask more explicitly, um, do you ever get misidentified as a refugee? Does your family ever get misidentified? If so, how upset? would you feel? And if you've been misidentified, um, who misidentifies you? And so you can select from different groups of people. And of course, Somali Kenyans were way more likely to say that they have been misidentified. I think one out of four of my survey respondents said that they were misidentified. And uh, for them, um, so for the 25% the that say they've been misidentified, when I ask who, it's overwhelmingly the police and it's overwhelmingly other government officials. So it's the state who misidentifies them. And when that happens, it's really consequential because that means they're gonna be put under curfew, they might be jailed, detained, asked to see their papers, things like that. All right, so lastly, this is the final case of Uganda where it's kind of like my control case in which um, there is co-ethnicity, but they're living in a context where the Ugandan state does not Although it's authoritarian, it does not stigmatize the refugees there. In fact, politicians often talk and newspapers talk about refugees as if they are brothers and sisters. And so in this case, I would expect solidarity. Um, and so here's some examples, a lot of newspaper examples saying like Uganda's the uh, stands out in refugee hospitality. Um, they're a model of how to treat refugees. 
refugees are like our brothers. That's often the sort of elite rhetoric that we see. Of course, this doesn't mean there isn't any social conflict between host communities and the refugees there. Um, but I think there's just a lot less of what, we're, of what we should see in those other cases. Um, and so this fall, I have some funding. I'm gonna do a very similar survey. Um, uh, in this part of Uganda, it's like the sort of Northwestern part. Um, this is one of the largest refugee camps um, in the world. It's called Bidi Bidi and it hosts South Sudanese. And the host communities around there I'm expecting are going to be co-ethnic. You can already see here, so this is Kampala, the capital, and sort of where all the refugees are. You can already see here that, you know, in Tanzania, it was like three camps. In Kenya, it's two camps. Here, there's over 30 settlements. And that's because refugees are allowed to live where they want to, for the most part. They're not forced to be in camps. So here, they just sort of naturally settle um, all along the, the Western part of the country. All right, so in conclusion, um, I think in this project, I really want to emphasize that hosting policies, political rhetoric, institutions, structures can shape the relationship between citizens and migrants. A lot of the immigration literature we see asks about public opinion of how citizens feel towards immigrants, and it almost assumes that, um, you know, the context is a given. So do you oppose migrants because you feel economically competitive or racial discrimination? Um, but what I'm saying is that there's structures in place that can really shape those things. Second, when we do see instances of anti-migrant policies and rhetoric, they're almost in a way doubly pernicious. They're pernicious first because they teach majoritized citizens who may not know anything about migrants. They give them stereotypes and, and, and negative things to repeat. But they're doubly pernicious because for the community that does know these people, their co-ethnics, sometimes literally their relatives, they make them feel like they have to strategically reject them. And again, those are the people that we might expect to be most welcoming. But in this case, they feel pressured to reject them. So that's why I say it's doubly pernicious. Um, next, you know, public backlash to migrant shocks. A lot of this backlash we've been seeing in Western countries is not inevitable, however. Um, if we can learn something from Uganda, it could be that you know, host governments have agencies, again, to shape that relationship. And they can do various things to, to, to make it so that there is less social conflict. Um, also, I think in this project, something that seems obvious, but we should consider is things like ethnicity, um, you know, they're not just variables to put on the right-hand side of a regression, right? They are, um, in my case, both an independent and a dependent variable. Um, we can feel more ethnic, less ethnic. We can try and change our ethnic identities in different ways. And lastly, the book is going to end um, considering on um, some other cases where this might happen. So for generalizability, um, I'm collecting data, focus group surveys right now of um, the case of Venezuelan migrants in Colombia, again, where we see a lot of co-ethnicity, of uh, Afghan refugees in Pakistan, especially Afghan refugees of Pashtun descent, with Pashtun minoritized groups in Pakistan, and with Asian Americans in the US. Um, so I'm actually gonna do that focus group in a few weeks and I'm very scared, but excited. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thanks for your questions. So I'm thinking about um, Hakeem Jefferson at Stanford has yeah. this paper about the politics of respectability. Mm -hmm. it looks like you're familiar with it, but what he's trying to explain is why African Americans have a high rate of supporting like pretty like tough on crime policies, which seems like it doesn't make sense because it disproportionately affects their own group. Okay. And the idea is that they want to separate themselves from like good African Americans want to separate themselves from the bad kind. And they right. want to like signal, they want some way for people to actually discriminate bad and good ones. Right. Um, and I think there's like similar research looking at immigrants in the US having anti-immigrant attitudes. And it's like, right. trying to be like we're not like those kinds exactly. of immigrants. Yeah. So do you think this is kind of another instance of that same phenomena of yeah. like trying to differentiate yourself to avoid discrimination and trying to like signal that you are different? Is it kind of the same? Yeah. Thing? I think so. I know I, I'm probably, you know, would feel the pressure to say, no, it's completely different. But no, I think it is very similar. It's all built on social identity theory. Um, 
yeah, Hakeem and I chatted a few weeks ago and we're like, yeah, we can kind of see this phenomenon everywhere mm-hmm. of if there's a group that's going to make me look bad, make my family look mm-hmm. bad. Um, if I might be lumped in with that group, then what can I do to separate us? Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I think what he and I were talking about was it, that's also context specific, right? Mm-hmm. So the survey on respectability, it kind of depends on who they think that they're maybe answering this question to or who they think that they're signaling to. I think in that case, they're mm-hmm. signaling to other Americans, white Americans. Um, but if they were put in a different context, they might not act that way, mm-hmm. right? So um, I think this is the same. Um, And I can just show in one survey, right, like just shifting how the survey questions are worded is going to shift how people react. And just a related point, does it need to be state stigmatization of the minority as opposed to just general stigmatization? Like where, how do you view public, just public opinion versus the state's actions? Because they're not always aligned. That is how I'm kind of struggling with this book. So thank you for picking out the part that I think is is tough because um, in my story, it's very much like a top down, like public opinion follows elite rhetoric. It's kind of like a Zoller-esque kind of world. And I think it's justifiable in the cases, you know, um, Tanzania and Uganda are authoritarian, Um, Kenya is more democratic, but still I would say, especially on an issue that the state really cares about, but um, you know, if refugees are just in the camps, it's it's not like the public already has xenophobic attitudes, I think, without state rhetoric. I think in that case, it's justified that it's sort of top down. Public opinion follows elite rhetoric. But that's not true everywhere. Um, and so, for example, um, Sandra Rosa is doing some really cool work in Colombia. I think you're on. Are you on some of those projects? We were. Yeah. Oh, gosh. OK. Yeah, but you know, um, she's finding that in that case, what's really interesting is the Colombian state was, has all these like very generous policies towards Venezuelans, um, helping them regularize, letting them stay there and work for like 10 years, giving them access to services. And yet public opinion has really had a backlash towards those policies. Um, and so Colombian citizens have actually been you know, really negative about it. Um, and that seems weird. Yeah, I think uh, yeah. yeah. I think what happens as well is some of the local politicians. Right. I was going to say because in general, I mean, uh, um, the Venezuelans refugees in Colombia they have been accepted. They don't live in camps. They have been given the right to work, right. Uh, especially during the pandemic, because they were also given health uh, access to health. Uh, but the question, I mean, the comment there is more like. I mean, some xenophobic uh, and more populist right. com- comments from some of the politicians. I think that's like what sparks as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that sparks the negative sentiment. And if they just said that, I mean, the criminals are the Venezuelans, and uh, this is what happened, and mm-hmm. then they amplify you, uh, whatever uh, incident that right. has happened, that then generalize to the other uh, part that these are all the Venezuelans. Then what? probably you managed to shift the opinion because originally actually the government of Colombia was not going to give them uh, access to health and then for the vaccines but there mm-hmm. was actually a backlash from the people the mm-hmm. Colombia said it should be and then they uh, switch mm-hmm. them right. so yeah. yeah so maybe you might want to nuances with some of the locals and then maybe uh, politicians and then nuance them in their rhetoric of just yeah. the populism that they have. That's great. Thank you. I mean, I will say what we've, um, so I've done some surveys with Maggie Peters and Alicia Holland um, on Colombians. Specifically, we did a survey where we target Cucuta and Cali. Cucuta's, you know, the border city. And so we think, we thought going in like, Um, because there's a lot of history of like circular migration, just migrating for work every day, that sort of thing, that they, the expectation is that they would be more welcoming of Venezuelans versus in Cali, there's not as many there. And so they might not know, they might not feel the connection and they would be, you know, more anti-Venezuelan migrants and anti these policies. But we actually found the opposite. In Cucuta, um, people were more likely to say that, 
Venezuelans will not integrate well here, that there's a big cultural difference between Colombians and Venezuelans and like a, a whole bunch of other things. So that sort of surprised us. But I was also like, oh, well, maybe that sort of fits in here that other Colombians, when they think of Cucuta, they also think, well, they're basically, you know, they could be Venezuelan, like there's so much cross-border migration. Mm -hmm. So maybe they say, face sort of similar identity pressures. Yeah. Yeah, I happen to be a, an active volunteer in a refugee resettlement group in New Haven. That's a Jewish ethnic group that's settling many, many uh, Muslim uh, ethnic group peoples from Syria and Afghanistan. And the observation that I have related to controversy is the fact that after the refugees get comfortable by being settled by a Jewish American, they find and they and they see nice things happening. They finally say, "Oh my God, I didn't know what to expect to be uh, resettled or helped by a Jewish American. I thought it was going to be terrible because that's what I knew before." And vice versa could have happened that the Jewish volunteers could have said, "Well, with all the propaganda we hear about the Middle East and Israel, that it would have gone the other way." So that in fact, your pre-existing conditions are really there. And, and it validates everything you're saying. Um, yeah, thank you so much for, for that observation. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, you know, I think what you're looking at is two groups that might not necessarily know about each other that much before, but through the sort of positive contact, um, they're learning to, you know, change misperceptions that they might have held against each other. And, and I think it's interesting that, you know, put into a different context, um, like here in New Haven, that contextual change can also change how they think about their own identities and, and other people's identities. Um, if you want to learn more about contact theory work, I would redirect you to Salma Musa's research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you want to ask your question? Sure. Um, yeah, so I, I think the, the first one is about the role of kinship and how that might kind of, um, how that might complicate some of these dynamics and whether that's something that you see across your cases and it's something that you're able to pick up on in, in the surveys as well. And then um, I'll ask my gender question. Yeah. Because, so I think in your theory, the way I understand it, some of it has to do, um, the role of the state to me feels important because it it's it kind of sets up high stakes for being misidentified, right? right? And I'm thinking how those stakes might vary for men and women, particularly when um, refugees are seen as a security threat. And I'm particularly thinking of the Pakistan case where it is Pashtun males who are being kind of targeted for, mm -hmm. um, you know, for, um, for kind of police abuse and also um, racial profiling, right? right? And so I'm wondering if you see that dynamic in your cases and what that would, what you would expect based on that. Yeah, I think so. Um, and I can only say we basically only started this research. So this is based on like a handful of focus groups that we've done in Pakistan. And by we, um, I'm collaborating on this work with um, Nila for Siddiqui at SUNY Albany and Michelle Malik at Harvard. Um, and so in those focus groups, we basically did a couple focus groups with Afghan refugees and a couple focus groups with Pashtun community um, Pakistanis. And um, we did divide it up by gender. And what was really interesting was when we talked to the, not we, but you know, this, the research firm talked to the women and asked about Afghan refugees. In the beginning of the focus groups, it was all really, really positive. Um, like, yeah, you know, we, you know, um, there's a lot of connections, shared connections, but as the focus group went on, a lot more negative things came out. Um, things like economic competition. Um, yeah, and they did mention like men would get misidentified. Um, there'd be problems with their businesses, but for the women, um, it was pretty positive in the beginning. Um, in the male focus groups, it was kind of negative <laughs> from the very beginning. So that's sort of one thing that we saw that was different. It could be for other factors, but um, that is something that we observed. We are planning to do a larger survey on this, on co-ethnicity. Um, and what we're thinking right now for the survey design is to randomize the enumerator 
So whether the enumerator is passion or not. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, does it matter if you're answering these types of questions to like an outsider or to someone who you think is an insider? Um, and then the other thing is we want to vary the regions where um, Pashtun is the sort of regional majority versus whether they're also in the regional minority. And so maybe there's, you know, sort of these demographic considerations there. Kind of on this, I was thinking, I was wondering if you can get any variation on how easy it is to mistake someone for a member of the, of the refugee group, mm -hmm. whether you can get some leverage, like just based on some physical attributes. So I think gender is a great idea. This is a really good way because the observable implication from your theory is like you're going to mm -hmm. get those people are the ones who are going to distance themselves the most, the ones right. who are the most easily mistaken for the stigmatized group. So I feel like gender is one way to get at it. I mean, Somalis and Kenya is another way because like Somalis have a very different, very different physical features mm -hmm. from other Kenyans. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's like some other way to get at this based on language, based on like yeah. religion, maybe how they dress. Like yeah. you have some accents. Yeah, accents, like some variation of how, how easy it is. How to do you think them. would be a creative way to measure that? Like say we're doing we're doing our survey yeah. in Pakistan. Like, um, I mean, we we'll, so we're gonna try and like the thing that we want to randomize is enumerator identity. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a question we can ask at the beginning of the survey is like asking the enumerator to guess. So I asked our enumerators in Kenya to guess as well. Our enumerators in Kenya were all from those areas. Um, because they had to know the local languages and they guessed a hundred percent like they knew exactly like they looked at the person they were like oh this person's Turkana this person's Somali this person is you know some other group and they were like it was all it was like 99.9 percent .9 correct um but I wonder if yeah if we vary you know the identity of the enumerator and ask them at the beginning like before you even start the interview you know, check off who you think this person is just based on looking at them. I was thinking just in terms of analyzing the survey data you already have. Oh, yeah. Like whether that's something that mediates the, it's not just co-ethnicity, but you can actually get more nuanced mm -hmm. measures. So like if there are men, for example, and co-ethnics, like yeah. whether that treatment. Of yeah, that's possible. I don't think I, yeah. I haven't really looked at the intersectionality of this, but mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. And I, think, I, I was thinking about it from like the perspective of how easy it is to be mistaken, but yeah. like also what are the consequences of being mistaken, yeah. right? So if you're a man, like being mistaken by a police officer, if you're then perceived as a security threat right. is likely a lot more consequential than if you're mistaken as a woman and not perceived as a security mm -hmm. threat because of I gendered see. expectations. Yeah. I think in Kenya, they do perceive women also as security threats. Yeah. 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 Um, but I, I mean, I'll look at that. That's super interesting. Thank you. I think at some point for this book project, I need to stop collecting new data. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how to do that yet. <laughs> Any cool. other questions from the people on Zoom? Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Thank this you. was really Thank fun. You.